All right, thank you all for uh, coming back so promptly. Um, what I'd like to do in the next hour and a half is actually share with you a puzzle that I've been working on. It's truly a work in progress, and it truly is something I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about. Um, let, to tee it up, I'll just point to a couple of things the Commandant said that, if we think about it, are, at least on the surface, inconsistent with each other. On the one hand, he quoted Secretary Gates talking about senior leader failure, and he talked about how much the fact that they are at these elevated uh, levels tends to go to people's head and cloud their judgment. Now, if you think about that for a minute, it would suggest that although the person is the same person, the changing in, of their environment and context has effects on their thought processes and even on their behavior that they themselves might not necessarily anticipate. On the other hand, when he ended, we ended up with a ringing endorsement of the concept of integrity, uh, something which is, suggests that this, this makes you almost immune to moral failure and capable of operating in any environment without any challenges. And so I've been spending the last year or so thinking about that conundrum. How does that actually work? And so that's what this talk is about. I'm not kidding when I, want, when I say I want to be intellectually humble about this because I am new to this field of moral psychology, which is what I've been reading lately. I'm by training a philosopher, and philosophers have certain ways of framing questions. And for the last 100 years, at least in the English-speaking world, those have not been much in touch with empirical questions. So I'll explain why we've been trying to reconnect them somewhat in actual formal philosophy. Um, that's the standard disclaimer. I don't really need it in this environment, but it makes Dave, Dave Lee happy, so OK. Um, so what I want to do is start, how do we normally think and talk about ethics specifically in the military? That's, that's the first question I want to tee up. Because the way we talk about it sets up a set of assumptions about how it works. Um, and then we design programs and train people based on the belief that because we make assumptions about how ethical reasoning and behavior works, that we're helping to improve our problem. So if it, would, if it turns out, if those assumptions turn out to be flawed, or at least even partially flawed, then we might be producing results that we don't expect, maybe even disastrous results that we didn't expect. And then we scratch our heads and say, how could that possibly be? Because we designed all these programs so well based on our assumptions about how this works. Uh, and so the, thought, the extra thought doesn't usually occur to us. I wonder if we should go back and re-examine the assumptions on which the whole thing was built. And, if, and maybe there are some reasons to have some doubts about that, and that's kind of what I'm going to suggest. So, uh, to telegraph the obvious up front, I'm going to suggest today there are some really fundamental flaws in the way that we have historically thought about this. And, I'm gonna, and it's partly the fault of my discipline. It's partly the fault of philosophy, uh, for reasons I'll explain briefly. I won't bore you too much with the Aristotle, but a little Aristotle is, is helpful. Uh, and. Uh, and, and then there are some personal reasons why I got interested in this. Uh, reason number one is um, uh, uh, John Meyer and I and Admiral Kelly get to talk to the major command course, which is everybody taking 06 command over in the Navy, uh, as does Admiral Christensen. And as you know, the Navy's experienced quite a rash of detachments for cause of late. And so there's a lot of kind of uh, concern in the Navy. What's that about? What's going on? And you know, there's several possible explanations of this. Um, one is, and people often say this, well, the standards have just changed. And to some degree, that's true. They have changed. You, things people used to get away with or be tolerated are no longer tolerated. So true, but also irrelevant, right? Um, the second thing is maybe these are people who've been messing up all along up to the rank of 05 or 06, which is where all the firings are actually happening, by and large, or the command master chief level. Uh, and they just finally get caught, right? So if that's what's going on, then that's a question about the promotion system and about the nature of officer evaluation and how could we screen better for these kinds of failures. And if you notice, uh, the chairman has been fiddling with that question regarding senior officers just lately, thinking about 360 feedback for senior leaders, various other kinds of ways of trying to detect these problems. But the third possibility is the one that really interests me. And I have no empirical evidence to know how much of these three are in play, what the proportions are. But suppose it's the case that somebody's been a perfectly squared away officer for 20, 22, 24 years, and then they get to these senior ranks, and then they fail. And if you read the Navy Times or any other services, the way they fail are often so bizarre that if they weren't so tragic, they'd almost be funny. 
I mean, just think, how in the world could they possibly do these things, right? I mean, you all know the kinds of cases I'm referring to. And so if it's the third case, that is, they've been fine for a long time, and then they get to these ranks and they suddenly fail spectacularly, that would suggest there's something about the nature of the environment that we're putting them in that is so disorienting for them, or so different from what they're used to doing, that that does lead to failure. And, there, and there's a ton of, of empirical evidence that people who are confused and disoriented don't tend to act really well under those circumstances. So again, I'm, it's an empirical question what the proportions of these three causes are, and right now nobody can answer the question which of them it is. But for my intellectual purposes, I'm interested in a third possibility. Okay? Does everybody understand where I'm going here? Let me stop, any questions? even at this stage. Because this can be a dialogue. I'm happy with that. I really want to, I, this is work in progress for me, so I don't know. This is tentative. Okay. And the other reason why is there's this new branch of philosophy, my discipline, called, guess what, experimental philosophy. Uh, and this has started with a bunch of young philosophers, mostly in their 30s, who uh, had the bright idea, I wonder if you could do any kind of empirical research that would be relevant to philosophical questions. Who knew? Now, nobody in philosophy has asked that question for 100 years uh, in the English-speaking world because we put our feet on the chair and drink a cup of coffee and we think, and then we write our little articles, and that's, that's how you do philosophy. Um, and uh, um, you, you don't even need a window, you know, just your pen and pencil will do. Um, and so these guys started doing some empirical research, and so I got the opportunity to spend last summer at the University of Arizona where I was the old guy with a bunch of these young experimental philosophers, but I got kind of dipped shallowly in the experimental philosophy pool and thought, this is interesting. I wonder where this goes. Um, on the one hand, it's kind of cool. On the other hand, in many cases, you kind of think these are like research psychologists operating without a license, right? Because they, I mean, they don't really have the training in the empirical uh, research disciplines that a research psychologist would have. So you've got to be a little nervous about the methodology sometimes. But that's a scholarly cavil, OK? Um, let's start with what I think is the way military people usually think about ethics. Um, this is grounded in ideas of virtue and in the concept of integrity. Uh, actually, it's occurred to me as I listen to military people talk about ethics, there are really three words you guys like. Character, integrity, and professional. And those can kind of be used in all, kind of in all purpose kinds of ways, right? Um, so let's talk a little about the intellectual background of that way of thinking about ethics. First, there's a problem with the word virtue, at least in my mind. I mean, a virtue sounds to me kind of quaint and Victorian, okay? Uh, I don't know if it has that ring to you, but that's how it seems to me. So we gotta do a little fun with Greek to figure out what the word virtue has historically meant uh, in this literature. Um, it comes from the Greek word arete, which means the functional excellence of a thing. So, any Greek philosopher, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all of them always operates the same way. First question is, what is this thing for? And then how do you determine whether it does what it's for well or badly? Okay, so in Plato, there's a line in the Republic where he talks about virtuous pruning hooks, right? And that makes perfect sense in Greek. You can be a virtuous pruning hook because you got the top rating in a consumer report. You, you do what pruning hooks do really well. Right? And so the word virtue means the functional excellence of the thing, given the kind of thing it is. Okay? That's, the, that's the old definition. So uh, the military virtues are the functional excellences that are necessary for military people to do military things well and effectively. Take, for example, the virtue of courage. Aristotle says, Courage is the mean between the extremes of cowardice and foolhardiness. You can go wrong in either direction. And it's very hard. You can't write you a formula for what this is. But generally, we know it when we see it, when we see a truly courageous person. And sometimes we confuse the foolhardy with them, but usually not for too long, because they don't tend to hang around that long. Uh, so, um, so you need these excellences to be able to do your job. So. That invites the question, well, how do we think we come to have these virtues, these excellences, these arete? Well, it turns out that the answer Aristotle gave 2,500 years ago is basically the military answer. 
And we've been wedded to this answer ever since. And as I lay it out, and I think if you think about how military training works, it'll occur to you, even if you've never heard of Aristotle, and certainly if you've never read a word of him, you are all closet Aristotelians. You just didn't know it, okay? Uh, what Aristotle says is, look, you come out of the womb with a bunch of capacities. You have capacities for athletic activity. You have capacities for intellectual activity. You have capacities for musical ability. You have capacities for artistic ability. Uh, and all of these come to you neither, he says, you don't get the virtues by nature because you're not, you don't come out of the womb with these functional excellences, but it's not contrary to nature either because you have the capability built in. It's just a question of whether it's going to be developed or not, right? So um, some of these capacities will be developed and some won't. How do you do it? He says, well, how do you become an excellent harp player? By playing the harp. On the other hand, he says, you can play the harp a long time and be really crappy at it too, right? Um, so if you're going to get to be an excellent harp player, unless you're just incredibly naturally talented, at some point you're probably going to need a teacher, a tutor, or a mentor, someone who coaches you on this. And that coaching is initially going to be kind of painful because it's going to push you out of your comfort zone, right? The example I give to my Stockdale class is, you know, when I was a kid, I took piano lessons for a while. Obviously, I never got very good at it. But I re remember being confused why my teacher really cared about the fingering of row, row, row your boat, right? Um, and I, it just made no sense to me. I thought if I hit the right notes at the right sequence, who cares about the fingering, right? But what my teacher knew that I didn't know, and I never went far enough to care, is that if eventually I wanted to play Franz Liszt or something, the fingering was going to matter, uh, you know, because your most human hands can't get to all those notes if they're not really picky about how they do it. Um, so he says, you know, you'll develop these, some of these you'll develop poorly. Those will become like vices, bad habits. And some of them you'll develop well, and they will become your functional excellences, your virtues. And he says, the interesting thing about that, you do it by repetitive activity, usually under some kind of supervision to make sure that you're doing it well, that you're getting it right. So think about what you do. Uh, I use this example only in theory. If uh, you have a bad golf swing, you go hire a pro to tell you what's wrong with your golf swing, right? And, and you've gotten yourself habituated to a way of doing it which consistently slices. And you, your chances that you'll fix this yourself are pretty small. You need somebody who can watch what you're doing and tell you here's what you're doing wrong, right? That's the expert who helps you with this. So think about how military, military training works. You do the activity over and over and over again with supervision and feedback, right? And at the end of that process, if all goes well, it becomes quite kind of automatic, right? You call it muscle memory. You can kind of rely on this to happen. Um, um, so when you add all that up, this formation of all of these habitual activities forms a, a, a bunch of habits, which are these inbuilt, routinized ways of doing things uh, that are now familiar to you. So what was once perhaps painful or uncomfortable now becomes routine and perhaps, he says, if it all goes really well, it even becomes pleasurable. Right? You, you would actually take pleasure in this activity, even though when you first started doing it, it might have been unpleasant or at best neutral. And you add up all these habits and you get something called character. Right? That, so character is the sum of all these habits that you built up. And then we label integrity being consistent with that formed character. Okay, again, I'm going to stop because this is kind of important. Does everybody follow me so far? This is just Aristotle 101 so far. Okay, any comments, questions? All right, so when we use the word integrity in the military, what are we implying? We're implying that there are a stable and reliable set of virtues that are reliable across different environments and contexts, right? So uh, people talk about this in terms of, if I can look at myself in the mirror and I have integrity, then, then I'm, I'm good, right? Um, uh, character, talk about it the same way. And then we have this all-purpose term professional, which is meant to incorporate a set of virtues, a set of arete specifically appropriate to the, kind, the nature of the activity of the military profession. And those are the virtuous versions of that. So this all adds up to the character assumption. And this is a quote from a, a philosopher who's one of the founding fathers of the experimental philosophy movement. So let me just let you read that for a minute. Had the pleasure of spending some time with John in Arizona, 
which was very useful to me. Okay, everybody had a chance to read it? Now, notice the title of John's book, Lacking Character. So what he's out to show in his book is this is false. This is not true. I can prove to you that this is not true. Okay? I realize this is very countercultural for this audience. Right? That's why I'm being tentative about it. But the, long, the longer I read this stuff, and I've been at it for about a year, the more convinced I am that it's not true and that our belief that it is has bad effects. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about. Um, so what if this is all based on false assumptions? Um, what if the whole idea of a fixed character is empirically false? Um, is it possible that saying that you're all people of good character, therefore we can completely trust you and any environment and you will be good to go and we don't need to worry about you? Um, if, that's not, if the character thing is not true, but we're relying on it, what follows? We are setting ourselves up for moral failure. We are setting ourselves up for moral failure because we're relying on something that turns out to be empirically not as reliable as our assumptions suggest that it is. Um, so the, the last big question, the so what question, is how would we change our approaches to training and thinking about allocation of responsibility and so forth if we included these situationalist factors in our calculation. And as you'll see at the end, I've talked myself into a quite philosophically confused muddle on that last point. So that's where you can really help me out when you get to it. Um, well, I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay, so most of you are probably familiar with this famous social psychological experiment, um, but I wanna play it for you anyway. This is a sh relatively short clip. I have two clips today, one is slightly longer. Hi, I'm Chris Cuomo, and welcome to our primetime webcast, a look at one of the most shocking experiments of the last 50 years, literally. Imagine this scenario. You go to a prestigious university to participate in a learning and memory experiment. When you arrive, you discover that the teaching instrument is this machine, which seems to give electroshocks to a man on the other side of the wall. As you move up the scale, he begins to scream out in pain. The experiment requires that you continue. The experimenter pressures you to go on. Would you agree to continue? Stop, that's all. 45 years ago, Dr. Stanley Milgram came up with this experiment to test whether people would blindly follow the orders of an authority figure. He found that two-thirds of his subjects were willing to give the most dangerous shock on the machine. We teamed up with Dr. Jerry Berger, a social psychologist at Santa Clara University in California, to see whether people have changed since then. Wrong. 90 volts. Ah! The typical response is to turn toward the experimenter and if not say something, at least give a look that says, what should I do? In our new experiment, how many people would agree to follow the orders of an authority figure? Ow. That's incorrect. 39-year-old Troy Shasker is an electrician. He's been paid $50 to participate and told that the money is his to keep even if he quits the experiment early. He's worried about the dangers of the electroshock machine. Wow. That's, I, don't think, I, I, don't, I don't think I can shock him that hard if he really does screw up. That's been a severe shock there. Yeah, there are 25. Yeah, I could just go get my shotgun. There are 20. In the room next door, Troy watches as the learner gets strapped into his chair and really gets nervous once he hears him say this. I should probably bring up a couple of years ago at Kaiser, they diagnosed a mild heart condition. I'm really not too worried about it. It's not that serious. But well, you should know that while the um, shocks that we'll be using today may be painful, they're not dangerous. Okay. Milgram intended that scripted exchange to set up a conflict in the subject's mind, a choice between the health of the learner and the authority of the experimenter. Number one. Then the test begins. Blue boy, girl, grass, hat. The learner must decide which of the four words is the correct match. At first, everything goes smoothly. Correct. I was confident that he was doing really good at first, and then it started looking bad. <laughs> then, at 75 volts, Troy hears the first sign of trouble. Soft. Rug. Pillow. Hair. Grass. 
Incorrect. 75 volts. Ah! I could actually hear him next door going, ow, oh, and he kept getting things wrong. Incorrect. 90 volts. Ah! At 105 volts, he's clearly uneasy. I got a little moist on my forehead there. I, I wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. I do not. I can't tell you why. I, why I listened to him and kept going. I should have just said no. The correct word was duck. Rock house. At 150 volts. Incorrect. 150 volts. Ah, that's all. Will Troy listen as the learner begs him to stop? Or will he follow Brian's orders? Tell him the correct word, pair of white. The, the correct word was white horse. And the next item, please continue. The next item is sad. He obeys the orders. Face. Why didn't you stop? The stra I saw him getting strapped in, and they were just like little... I mean, he could have just, if he was in that much pain, he could have just tore himself off. Why are you putting it on him and not you or the experimenter? I was just doing my job. <laughs> I was doing what I was supposed to do. 75 volts. So I, I guess the influence of having the, the conductor of the experiment right there next to me telling me to keep going had a lot to do with it. For the past 30 years, there have been severe restrictions on using humans in social psychology research. To avoid putting subjects under too much stress, Dr. Berger made a significant change to our experiment. In this experiment, you stopped at 150 make-believe volts. In Milgram, they went much higher. We stopped for ethical reasons. We couldn't put people through the, the agony that Milgram's participants went through. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Are there clues that indicate whether certain people might be more compliant with authority? Wrong. 90 volts. Ah! When you were watching, how good were you at guessing? Oh, this person may go or this may not. It was impossible to tell. I tried to guess. I tried to look for signs, body language, anything to try to guess who's going to continue and who's going to stop. And that tells me that it's, it's not that there are certain kinds of people who are obviously different from the rest of us. It tells me that probably all of us are capable. Thanks for watching our primetime webcast and be sure to watch again next week at abcnews.com. I'm Chris Plummer. Okay, so here's the data using the original Milgram voltages, which go up to, three, three, uh, to 450. So at 450, the subject is passed out, and they're continuing to shock them. Okay? So these are the percentages of people that would do it. Okay? Now, so what do you think that goes to show? Sixty-five percent went all the way to the max voltage, right? And, yeah. I think it goes to show the extreme power of authority. The extreme power of authority. Notice that, in fact, in this situation, there's very little authority, right? They've never met this experimenter before. He's just a guy in a white lab coat. They're told in advance, you, even if you quit, you get paid, right? So there's, uh, so there's very little reason that a person couldn't just say, I'm out of here, right? Compare that to a military environment in terms of the power of, of authority, right? So if, you, if authority of a one light, white lab coat of a guy you just met will get you to do that, you know, dot, 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 right? E extrapolate it on out. Okay, so what mi most of us presented with the Milgram experiment, I myself would say, I would never do that. I mean, I just wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I mean, I agree to the experiment, I might do the first few shocks, but once the person's obviously in distress, I just, wouldn't do it. Uh, but the data tells me I'm almost certainly wrong about this, right? I am almost certainly self-deluded about that. Um, and so if I'm going to think about my own moral behavior in a realistic way, I've got to take on board data like this that, you know, I don't know myself nearly as well as I'd like to think or that I'm not nearly as noble as I'd like to think when it comes to this kind of stuff. Put me in the wrong environment. And the data, at least in this case, suggests I probably would do it. Here's some more evidence. I love this one. This was done in the 70s when there were still a lot of payphones around. And so the researchers arranged to have 
uh, a person walk behind a person just getting off a payphone and drop a pile of papers. The question was, would the person getting off the payphone help the person who dropped the papers or not help them pick up the pile of papers? Notice the data. The only experimental intervention was putting a dime in the coin return of the phone sometimes. If you put a dime in the coin return, 87.5% of the uh, participants helped. If you didn't put a dime in the coin, 4% helped. 87.5 versus 4. And again, the intervention is a dime. So anybody have a hypothesis about what, why something intuitively absolutely trivial, like finding a dime in a coin return, would so decisively sway these numbers? Yeah, give it a shot. That seems to be the best hypothesis. Did everybody hear it? People are just a little bit happy. I mean, really trivially a little bit happy, right? I mean, trivially a little bit happy, are more likely to do it. Or this is one they did at Princeton Seminary. Um, they assigned the seminarians to write a talk about the Good Samaritan story in the Bible. Remember the story where uh, Jesus tells a story about this hated ethnic group, the Samaritans, who's the only guy, after all the supposed good people go by, who stops and helps the guy who's been beaten up by the roadside. Uh, and at least one takeaway from the story is, you know, is, uh, it's important to help people kind of regardless of whether they're your group or not your group, things like that. Um, so there, there, there are two groups of seminarians. One group was told, walk across campus at, at your leisure and give your talk uh, this afternoon. The other group was told, it's really important you be there on time. You've got about 15 minutes to get across campus. Uh, make sure you don't, you know, that you're not late. Sa seminary students, same seminary, presumably roughly the same values. Um, if the unhurried part participants stopped 63% of the time when they encountered an actor pretending to be a person in great distress, but the hurried participants stopped only 10% of the time. So that would suggest time pressure, you know, uh, sense of urgency will lead you to fundamentally different behaviors. You know? If I asked you in calm reflection in Sunday school class about the Good Samaritan story, uh, you'd probably all say, oh, yeah, yeah, we would do that. Right, that's what we would do. But the data suggests not true. Not true. Uh, and certainly don't count on it. Uh, it's OK, now this is a little longer. I love this guy. He's an Israeli guy who teaches at Duke. This is a TED talk, so it's what are the usual, what, 18 minutes or so. But it's so, it's so good that I want you to see the whole thing, because I've uh, learned a lot from his stuff. So here we go. messed up. What have I done? I was trying to get full screen, but that failed. Close it and try it again. I want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, predictable irrationality. And um, my interest in uh, irrational behavior uh, started many years ago in hospital. Um, I was burned uh, very badly. And if you spend a lot of time in hospital, you'll see a lot of types of irrationalities. And the one that uh, particularly bothered me in the burn department was the process by which the nurses took the bandage off me. Now, you must have all taken a Band-Aid off at some point, and you must have wondered what's the right approach. Do you rip it off quickly, short duration but high intensity, or do you take your Band-Aid off slowly? You take a long time, but each second is not as painful. Which one of those is the right approach? The nurses in my uh, department thought that the right approach was the ripping one. 
So they would grab hold and they would drip and they would grab hold and they would drip. And because I had 70% of my body burned, it would take about an hour. And as you can imagine, uh, I hated that moment of ripping with incredible intensity. And I would try to reason with them and say, why don't we try something else? Why don't we take it a little longer, maybe two hours instead of an hour, and have less of this intensity? And the nurses told me two things. Uh, they told me that they had the right model of the patient, that they knew what was the right thing to do to minimize my pain. And they also told me that the word patient doesn't mean to make suggestions or interfere. Or <laughs> <laughs> this is not just in Hebrew, by the way. It's in every language I've had experience with so far. <clears throat> and um, you know, there's not much, there wasn't much I could do. And they kept on doing what, what they were doing. And about three years later, when I left the hospital, uh, I started studying at the university. And one of the most interesting lessons I learned lessons, uh, was that there is an experimental method that if you have a question, you can create a replica of this question in some abstract way, and you can try to examine this question, maybe learn something about the world. So that's what I did. I was still interested in this question of how do you take bandages of burn patient. So originally, I, I didn't have uh, much money, so I uh, went to a hardware store, and I bought a carpenter's vise, and I would bring people to the lab, and I would put their finger in it, and I would crunch it a little bit. <laughs> And I would crunch it for long periods and short periods, and pain it went up and pain it went down, and with breaks and without breaks, all kinds of versions of pain. And when I finished hurting people a little bit, I would ask them, so how painful was this, or how painful was this? Or if you had to choose between the last two, which one would you choose? <coughs> I kept on doing this for a while. <coughs> and then, like all good academic projects, I got more funding. I moved to sounds, electrical shocks. I even had a pain suit that I could get people to feel much more pain. <laughs> but at the end of this process, what I learned was that the nurses were wrong. Here were wonderful people with good intentions and plenty of experience, and nevertheless, they were getting things wrong predictably all the time. It turns out that because we don't encode duration in the way that we encode intensity, I would have had less pain if the duration would have been longer and the intensity was lower. It turns out it would have been better to start with my face, which was much more painful, and move toward my legs, giving me a trend of improvement over time that would have been also less painful. And it also turns out it would have been good to give me breaks in the middle to kind of recuperate from the pain. All of these would have been great things to do, and my nurses had no idea. And from that point on, I started thinking, are the nurses the only people in the world who get things wrong in this particular decision, or is it more general? case, and it turns out it's a more general case. There's a lot of mistakes we do. And um, I want to give you one example of one of these irrationalities, and um, I want to talk to you about cheating. And the reason I picked cheating is because it's interesting, but also it tells us something, I think, about the stock market situation we're in. So my interest in cheating started when Enron came on the scene, exploded all of a sudden. And I started thinking about what is happening here. Is it the case that there is kind of a few apples who are um, capable of doing these things? Or are we talking a more endemic situation that many people are actually capable of behaving this way? So like we usually do, I decided to do a simple experiment. And here's how it went. If you were in the experiment, I would pass you a sheet of paper with 20 simple math problems that everybody could solve, but I wouldn't give you enough time. When the five minutes were over, I would say, pass me the sheets of paper, and I'll pay you a dollar per question. People did this. I would pay people $4 for their task. On average, people would solve four problems. Other people I would tempt to cheat. I would pass the sheet of paper. When the five minutes are over, I would say, please shred the piece of paper, put the little pieces in your pocket or in your backpack, and tell me how many questions you got correctly. People now solve seven questions on average. <laughs> Now, it wasn't as if there was a few bad apples, a few people who cheated a lot. Instead, what we saw is a lot of people who cheat a little bit. Now, in the economic theory, cheating is a very simple cost-benefit analysis. You say, what's the probability of being caught? How much do I stand to gain from cheating? And how much punishment would I get if I get caught? And you weigh these options out, you do the simple cost-benefit analysis, and you decide whether it's worthwhile to commit the crime or not. So we tried to test this. For some people, we varied how much money they could get away with, how much money they could steal. 
We paid them 10 cents per correct question, 50 cents, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars per correct question. You would expect that as the amount of money on the, on the table increases, people would cheat more, but in fact it wasn't the case. We got a lot of people cheating, but still by a little bit. What about the probability of being caught? Some people shredded half the sheet of paper, so there was some evidence left. Some people shredded the whole sheet of paper. Some people shredded everything, went out of the room, and paid themselves from a ball of money that had over $100. You would expect that as the probability of being caught goes down, people would cheat more, but again, this was not the case. Again, a lot of people cheated by just by a little bit, and they were unsensitive to these economic incentives. So we said, if people are not sensitive to the economic rational theory explanations to the, these forces, what could be going on? And we thought, maybe what is happening is that there are two forces. At one hand, we all want to look at ourselves in the mirror and feel good about ourselves, so we don't want to cheat. On the other hand, we could cheat a little bit and still feel good about ourselves. So maybe what is happening is that there's a level of cheating we can't go over, but we can still benefit from cheating uh, at, a, at a low degree as long as it doesn't change our impressions about ourselves. We call this like a personal fudge factor. <laughs> now, how would you test a personal fudge factor? Initially, we said, what can we do to shrink the fudge factor? So we got people to the lab, and we said, we have two tasks for you today. First, we asked half the people to recall either 10 books they read in high school or to recall the Ten Commandments. And then we tempted them with cheating. Turns out, the people who tried to recall the Ten Commandments, and in our sample, nobody could recall the Ten Commandments, <laughs> but those people who tried to recall the Ten Commandments, given the opportunity to cheat, did not cheat at all. It wasn't that the more religious people, the people who remembered more of the commandment, cheated less, and the less religious people, the people who couldn't remember almost any commandment, cheated more. The moment people thought about trying to recall the Ten Commandments, they stopped cheating. In fact, even when we give self-declared atheists the task of swearing on the Bible and we give them a chance to cheat, they don't cheat at all. Now, Ten Commandments is something that is hard to bring into the education system, so we said, why don't we get people to sign the honor code? So we got people to sign. I understand that this short survey falls under the MIT honor code. Then they shredded it. No cheating whatsoever. And this is particularly interesting because MIT doesn't have an honor code. <laughs> <laughs> so all this was about decreasing the fudge factor. What about increasing the fudge factor? The first experiment, I walked around MIT and I distributed six packs of Cokes in the refrigerators. These were common refrigerators for the undergrads. And I came back to measure what we technically call the half-lifetime of Coke. How long does it last in the refrigerators? And you can expect it doesn't last very long. People take it. In contrast, I took a plate with six $1 bills and I left those plates in the same refrigerators. No bill was ever disappeared. Now, this is not a good social science experiment. So to do it better, I did the same experiment as I described to you before. A third of the people, we passed the sheet, they gave it back to us. A third of the people, we passed it, they shredded it, they came to us and said, Mr. Experimenter, I solved X problems, give me X dollars. A third of the people, when they finished shredding the piece of paper, they came to us and said, Mr. Experimenter, I solved X problems, give me X tokens. We did not pay them with dollars, we paid them with something else. And then they took this something else, they walked 12 feet to the side and exchanged it for dollars. Think about the following intuition. How bad would you feel about taking a pencil from work home compared to how bad would you feel about taking 10 cents from a petty cash box? These things feel very differently. Would being a step removed from cash for a few seconds by being paid by a token make a difference? Our subjects double their cheating. <coughs> I'll tell you what I think about this in the stock market in a minute. But this did not solve the, the big problem I had with Enron yet, because in Enron there's also a social element. People see each other behaving. In fact, every day when we open the news, we see uh, examples of people cheating. What does this cause us? So we did another experiment. We got a big group of students to uh, be in the experiment, and we prepaid them. So everybody got an envelope with all the money for the experiment, and we told them that at the end, we asked them to pay us back the money they didn't make. <coughs> okay? The same thing happens when we give people the opportunity to cheat. They cheat, they cheat just by a little bit, all the same. But in this experiment, we also hired an acting student. This acting student stood up after 30 seconds and said, I solved everything. What do I do now? And the experimenter said, if you finished everything, 
go home. That's it. The task is finished. So now we had a student, an acting student, that was a part of the group. Nobody knew there was, there, it was an actor. And they clearly cheated in a very, very serious way. What would happen to the other people in the group? Will they cheat more or will they cheat less? <clears throat> Here is what happens. It turns out it depends on what kind of sweatshirt they're wearing. <laughs> Here's the thing. We ran this at uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And at, Carnegie, at, at Pittsburgh, there are two big universities, Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh. All of the subjects sitting in the experiment were Carnegie Mellon students. When the actor was getting up, was a Carnegie Mellon student. He was actually a Carnegie Mellon student, but he was a part of their group. Cheating went up. But when he actually had the University of Pittsburgh sweatshirt, <laughs> cheating went down. <clears throat> now, this is important because remember, when the moment the student stood up, it made it clear to everybody that they could get away with cheating. Because the experimenter said, you finished everything, go home, and they worked with the money. So it wasn't so much about the probability of being caught again. It was about the norms for cheating. If somebody from our in-group cheats, and we see them cheating, we feel it's more appropriate as a group to behave this way. But if it's somebody from another group, these terrible people, I mean, not terrible in, the, in the, this, but somebody we don't want to associate ourselves with, from another university, another group, all of a sudden, people's awareness of honesty goes up, a little bit like the Ten Commandments experiment, and people cheat even, even less. <clears throat> so what, what have we learned from this about cheating? We've learned that a lot of people can cheat. They cheat just by a little bit. When we remind people about their morality, they cheat less. When we get bigger distance from cheating, <clears throat> from the object of, of money, for example, people cheat more. And when we see things of cheating around us, particularly if it's a part of our in-group, cheating goes up. Now, if we think about this in terms of the stock market, think about what happens. What happens in a situation when you create something where you pay people a lot of money to see reality in a slightly distant Okay, I'm not going to go on with the stock market example. It's very interesting, and he has several of these TED Talks, so if you're interested in him, this is the guy, and I recommend you go watch him. But just off the top of your heads, what are, what are the takeaways from that series of experiments that Ariely did? Let's start with the sweatshirt experiment. I mean, what does that go to tell us that's, that's applicable to military organizations? Yeah. Could use the mic if you can, please. Good. Anybody else? So think about this for a minute. If you were interested in the Commandant's attempts to deal with the sexual assault problem, and you were going to take on board this kind of research, it might lead you down a different kind of path for thinking about what you would want to do about it. Anybody got a thought about that? Because what we're going to do is put people in rooms like this and show them a lot of PowerPoint slides, right? That's, that's, you know that's coming, right? But if, if, we're, if we worry about Ariely's problem very much, what would you suggest? What, if there is a fix, what is it? Come on, guys, any number can play here. Yeah, please. Good. Uh, there was a hand back here somewhere. Yes, please. Does everybody see the bottom line answer to the question would be, we don't do that. 
I mean, when you've got a culture where people say, we don't do that. So when the, 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 the misbehavior is made the outgroup guy, right? That's where you've got the R-E-L-E stuff working for you. Because it's about the sweatshirt, right? Is this our team or is this not our team? Are these our guys or are they not our guys? Also, it was a little subtle, but did everybody understand that little experiment he did where he separated the cheating from actual handling of money just by 12 feet? I mean, that's a pretty cool one too, right? The minute you make it even slightly more abstract, less obvious that you're cheating, your probability of doing it goes way up, right? Um, and so, insofar as organizations create that kind of, so I think this is really important. The reason I'm wasting your time on this is because as future commanders, if we take any of this seriously, far more important than anything you say to your people at a formal gathering is gonna be what kind of climate is created for what's a tolerable behavior. And once it's real clear, if you wanna be part of us, you know, this, this is how we are. And by the way, what do we know about 19-year-olds in uniforms? They really do want to be part of a group and dress alike and, and march in line, right? I mean, that's kind of what they want to do. So insofar as you control that mechanism, you control something far more powerful than you think. Uh, okay, now it seems to me in a way, what's weird about this is we already know this, right? I mean, this is why I thought the Commandant's thing was interesting, because we, we literally talk out of both sides of our mouths about this problem. On the one hand, we give the sermons about integrity and character, and imply by that that if you've got that, you're okay, you're good to go, there is no problem, right? And in the very next breath, we talk about why things go bad in poorly led units, in units that have poor morale, and in units that don't have good unit cohesion. So how do we connect the dots between these two ways of looking at the problem? Uh, and how do we do it in a way that still allows us to assign moral and legal responsibility, but is also empirically accurate to what's going on? So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, there's a, a great book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Black Hearts, One Platoon's Descent into Madness in Iraq's Triangle of Death by Jim Frederick. Uh, this was recommended to me by uh, General McMaster in the Army. This is an account of that, uh, of that army unit that formed a plan over a period of time to rape an Iraqi girl, burn her family, destroy the house, and cover up the story. Uh, it's a horrific to book, but what I like about the book, you know, in the scare quotes form of like, is it's, it cuts the salami very thinly. It sort of shows how these guys got there. And it, you know, it didn't happen one bad evening, is the point of the story, right? It, it happened because a lot of things were going wrong, a lot of people in their chain of command knew things were going wrong and failed to, to take effective action. Some people even tried to do some things to prevent this, but they were in the ineffective, ineffective and what you got was this atrocity, right? So thinking about atrocity stuff will get you there. So that would suggest if we're to think about this accurately and not just rhetorically, the hard problem is this. How do we balance blaming individuals for their misbehavior, which we've got to do, right, with examination of the situational factors the leaders who put them there created? And that's important both to assign the blame to the individual bad actors appropriately, but also arguably to broaden our sense of who's responsible for what. You know, because take Abu Ghraib as an example. If you know anything about the, the uh, Zimbardo prison experiments, in which a, a bunch of, does everybody know this experiment? Zimbardo put a bunch of Stanford undergraduates in a basement of a university building for a weekend. And they, these all were st Stanford undergraduates, right? Fellow undergraduates, college students. Assigned one group to be prison guards and one group to be prisoners. They had to terminate the experiment after two days because the guards had become so abusive to their prisoners. Now think about that. Stanford undergraduates, dealing with other Stanford undergraduates in a role-playing exercise. So if you, if you know that, what's the probability that a bunch of ill-trained National Guard MPs put alone in an Iraqi prison are gonna misbehave? I would say it's somewhere close to 100%. Um, and if you tell me, oh, well, we didn't see that coming, then at best you're ignorant, right? At worst, you're self-deluded. I mean, that's absolutely, almost certainly going to happen. 
Now, the, the philosophical problem here is Zimbardo actually testified at the Abu Ghraib trials. Um, my, my friend, George Mastriani, who's a psychologist at the Air Force Academy, wrote a really excellent article about Zimbardo's testimony. It's in Parameters, the Army War College Journal, a couple of years ago. But he basically chronicles how Zimbardo just ties himself completely in knots in terms of unable to assign ethical responsibility or legal responsibility to anybody for anything, right? Because the danger of the situationalist account is it can so wash away all versions of personal responsibility that we're just left to throw up our hands and say, oh, it's all situationalism. And that can't be right, but on the other hand, just pretending that situational factors don't play can't be right either. And that's the philosophical muddle I've steered myself nicely in the middle of. And I'll try to give you some preliminary thoughts about ways you might throw a rope to the shore, but I'm by no means done with this, because you can see it's a very hard problem. Um, anybody have, before I proceed, any thoughts about the problem? Everybody understand the problem? Okay. Well, first, blinding flash of the obvious. Character is not as reliable as the way we talk about it. it period, full stop. It's just not true. That's, that's an empirical, provable fact. And if you doubt me, just go uh, read some moral psychology lit, and come back, and we'll talk. I mean, because I mean, the experiments are just overwhelming on this. Um, but here's the more important point. Continuing to talk as if it is, continuing to talk as if character and integrity are as reliable as the rhetoric we have around them tends to suggest, is actually dangerous. It is dangerous because it leads us to think that because we've done character education, for example, then people are good to go. I used to teach at the Air Force Academy, and there's something every year there called the National Character and Leadership Symposium, which is a two or three day event, and I'm not exaggerating. What happens at this event is cadets and other college students are exposed to basically uh, preaching by beauty queens and football coaches and all kinds of people, basically exhorting them to be good. Right? Um, it always struck me that this is a colossal waste of time, money, and effort. Right? I mean, does anybody believe that anybody will be decisively made a better human being for any extended period of time by being exhorted for a brief period of time? Um, I don't think so. At best, exhortation would work if you're part of an organized community that hangs together for a long time and keeps the same message going at you regularly, right? Maybe that. But certainly not you know, one-off talks by one person or another. So the other thing that's really important about the moral psych literature is, and I can't stress this enough, most of these things have interventions that if, if I told them to you, you'd say, that is f so trivial. It couldn't possibly affect the way people behave. You just would not believe that something that small could affect others or you. Um, but think about the phone booth. A dime, 87.510. Look at that swing in behavior based on a dime. So that would suggest that when you are leaders, um, one of the things I, I like to talk about with, with uh, John and Emerald Kelly over the major command course is, if you think about how military organizations handle failures, there's what I call the holy trinity of solutions. Uh, you uh, fire the leadership, you mandate new training, and you issue a new policy. And, and somehow those things in some combination are supposed to be the universal fix for every failure. Um, but I think if we think about it, it's pretty clear that is, we already know that isn't true, right? Uh, the example I like to give is uh, when I worked for the Army, General Shinseki came in as Chief of Staff and he called Carlisle and said, I need 10 colonels to study the readiness reporting system in the Army because the one thing I'm sure of is that I have no idea how ready the Army is today. And why is that? Because the culture of the Army then would not allow anybody to report below C2. You know, so if you're a little, you're an O3 company commander, and you falsely report your C3 unit to be C2, are you lying? Well, in the ordinary sense of the word, of course. If stating intentionally and deliberately something you know not to be true, to be true on an official report is not lying, what would be lying? On the other hand, that would be a totally boneheaded way of looking at what's going on, right? Because the reason that the captain is reporting falsely 
is because the culture won't allow the behavior. It's a system effect that drives the behavior. So unless somebody with some stars on their shoulders fixes the system, the behaviors are not going to change. Right? So I invite you to think about that as you rise in rank because you start controlling systems. And so when confronted with failure, you might just at least take an extra tick before you resort to the Holy Trinity solutions, right? To ask yourself, what's driving this behavior? And, and do I own anything that's driving this behavior? Uh, it, you may know that it's a system that's driving the behavior and you may not know enough, own enough to fix it. I mean, that's certainly true. Uh, although that would be part of your job, I think, in terms of feeding up your chain of command to try to get your chain of command to come to terms with the, the system failure, right? But, um, you know, I, I, going back to the sexual assault question, it seems to me we were confusing two very different things. I mean, the general point is that, that everybody, and especially young people, are very interested in sex. This is not news. Um, and consensual sex is, uh, is going to go on no matter what, and some of it's going to be injurious to good order and discipline, and you're going to have to deal with it, and that's that, okay? Sexual assault is not that. I mean, it's, it, it bears no resemblance to that. And so there's no reason to, be, to merge those conversations as if somehow we're talking about the same thing, right? So it seems to me that when you go back to the t-shirt problem, one solution is, you know, how, how do we treat each other as shipmates? How do we treat each other as, as airmen, as, as soldiers? Um, and, you know, in a, in a well-run unit, you this level of respect for each other would prohibit abusive behavior. It's, you're not going to prohibit consensual sex. I mean, you're going to have to deal with it as a discipline matter. Okay, but let's take that off the table as a separate problem from what we're talking about. So this is my point about, about the uh, Holy Trinity. If you really are interested in good behaviors and not just, you know, trottering out the rhetoric of, of integrity, it would behoove us to be spending a lot of time studying and attempting to control environments. Uh, and to better understand how these factors drive the behaviors that we're seeing. Because we don't really, because we frame the question in terms of Aristotelian virtue, it kind of doesn't invite us to look empirically at this side of the problem. That's really the burden of my talk today. We need to supplement, not replace, character talk with context talk, since we know that it's far more decisive than we normally think it is. So even at the level of moral responsibility, um, we don't necessarily want to focus only on the individuals who did the observable bad act. Um, for example, in the law, if I put you in an environment that is foreseeably likely to cause you to fail, then some of the burden is on me, right? I, I should have foreseen that this would go badly, and I'm responsible to that. So, What's the, here's the philosophical problem that remains. And if you've got any thoughts about how to square the circle here, please let me know. Um, in, the, in the moral psych literature, they talk about, is it a bad apple problem or is it a bad barrel problem? Um, you know, is it just a few bad apples or you just put these apples in a really bad barrel and practically any apple is going to go bad in that barrel, right? Um, hard to know, but there are some really bad barrels out there, right? And, and we would do well to th think about where the notably bad barrels are. And if we absolutely got to put people into them, then what can we do to prepare them? And I'm here to suggest that just talking about their integrity and character probably is not going to be sufficient. Probably is not going to be sufficient if it's a really bad barrel, because uh, all of us are subject to this. Um, so I think there's a vast area for empirical research here. This sounds weird coming from a philosopher, I know, but the longer I think about it, I think we really don't understand this very well. Uh, what, what goes on in the environments we're putting people into and how do we better understand that? Um, now, as you probably know, uh, the group in Causal and now signed off by the scene has been working on this uh, leader development continuum, identifying uh, what we think people should uh, to use the old army phrase, be, know, and do at various levels of rank. Uh, it seems to me this is a perfectly appropriate way to integrate our ethics considerations with the leader development continuum. That what level of self-reflection, self-critical, and, and thinking about system effects 
uh, needs to kick in because you know you don't own much systems as an 03. You start owning systems as an 06. Uh, you certainly own systems as 07, 08. Um, and we, if we know that's important, then we should think about it. And we certainly know that as you advance in rank, your situation changes across the spectrum. That was the point that the commandant was making this morning about people kind of getting this inflated sense of self-importance or, or his example of memento mori, you know, remember that you were mortal. Um, you know, it'd be pretty hard to remember you're mortal, I, I think, in some of these environments. So um, I remember one of my favorite Army generals, Walt Omer, who retired a lieutenant general, told me a story with it. Uh, he went to his retirement ceremony, uh, and then when it was done, he walked with his wife and got in the back seat of the car, and his wife turned and said, you're going to have to drive, Walt. You know, I was, uh, uh, and it was, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't driven myself anywhere in, in quite a long time. So, okay, that's the gist of my talk. So thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.